through the city seen the faces passing by something's happened to my people like there's a wound deep inside when you say hope is just a dream feet on the ground you say we don't have the time as you watch your second hand I've seen time redefined in this tender land this tender Go find us a canoe. Let the river lead the way. Good evening. 
My name is Stephanie Opstead and I'm the branch manager of Dakota County's Lakeville Heritage Library. I'm very excited to welcome you to the 12th annual One Book, One Lakeville author event. Before we begin tonight's program, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dakota County Library and its nine branches are located on the traditional and ancestral lands of Indigenous people. Dakota County resides on land that has been inhabited by the Wapakuti and Medwankanton Dakota people and other Native nations from time immemorial. Seated in a land treaty signed in July of 1851, this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance for its original stewards, the Native nations and peoples of this region. We also want to respectfully acknowledge that Dakota County Library is the namesake of the Dakota people. By offering this acknowledgement, we work toward our values to act inclusively and our mission of learning and recognizing our collective responsibility to engage our community in understanding the history of the lands of indigenous people. Each year, one book promotes literacy, family reading and community by encouraging everyone to read and discuss one special book. This year, we are honored to celebrate This Tender Land by New York Times bestselling author, William Kent Kruger. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the Friends of the Lakeville Heritage Library, Anne Bruciani Lyon. Take it away, Anne. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Anne Bruciani Lyon, president of the Friends of the Lakeville Heritage Library, and we are delighted to have you with us tonight. I'd like to start by saying thank you to all of our donors. This program is made possible in part with funds from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, which was approved by Minnesota voters in 2008. It is also made possible by the generosity of community partners and individual donors like you. We appreciate your support. Before we go any further, there are a few quick housekeeping issues. First, I'm pleased to share that live captioning is available. Second, if you have any questions for the author, please submit them using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Although we may not have time to address all of tonight's questions, we will get to as many as we can. Third, this program is being recorded and will be shared on the Friends of the Lakeville Heritage Library Facebook page and on Dakota County Library's YouTube channel. Fourth, if you're interested in supporting the Friends in programs like this one, please make a donation via PayPal to Friends of the Lakeville Heritage Library. Last but not least, if you're interested in joining the Friends, please visit our website to learn more or to contact us. With that, I'll turn things over to Mayor Doug Anderson, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Anne, and hello, everyone. I'm Lakeville Mayor Doug Anderson, and I'm thrilled to be with you tonight to hear from New York Times bestselling author William Kent Kruger and his extraordinary book, This Tender Land. For me, this book seemed especially relevant given the challenges of the past year and the book's themes of racial injustice, hardship, homelessness, perseverance, interdependence, and hope. The Lakeville Heritage Library has played an important role in our journey, acting out its mission to keep us connected and to cultivate community, creativity, and learning through books and programs like this one. These books and programs connect us through stories, calming us, inspiring us, and helping us to better understand our history our future possibilities and each other. Connected communities are important to us all because they are the best places to live and work, to learn and thrive, and to raise families. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce nationally renowned and very accomplished author, William Kent Kruger. A resident of St. Paul, Minnesota, William Kent Kruger's last 10 novels were all New York Times bestsellers. His work has received many other awards, including the Minnesota Book Award, the Loft McKnight Fiction Award, the Anthony Award, the Edgar Award, the Dills Award, and the Friends of American Writers Prize. He will be joined in conversation with moderator Miss Shannon Paul, a popular comedian, podcaster, 
and Twin Cities TV and radio show host. We are delighted to welcome you both. Let's get the program started. We are excited to get the program started. Happy Saturday, everyone. I am Ms. Shannon, happy to be joining you from my home office and happy to be bringing to hopefully your home or however you are listening to this or watching this someplace comfortable with good snacks, we hope, the amazing William Kent Kruger. Um, Kent, I, I brought you something since I did this from my house and normally we were supposed to be in person and you would get a round of applause. So uh, everybody can, can just put clap, clap in the chat, but I brought you this. <laughs> there you go, all right. <laughs> yeah. One of the benefits of having me do this from my house. Hey, Kent, it's good to talk to you. We have been meaning to do this. I was supposed to be in person with you a year ago, and unfortunately, life. So it's good to finally be able to connect with you. How have you been holding up during this adventure? Um, all things considered quite well. And I have to tell you, it's so wonderful to hear your joyful, exuberant voice. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be able to talk to you. And thanks, you can see we do have a round of applause in the chat. So I wanna let everybody know what we're gonna do this evening. We are gonna have a, basically a monopolized conversation with our friend Kent here. I'm do my, going to do my best to uh, get to as many of your questions as possible. So feel free to post those in the chat and I will try and make sure that we relay them throughout the evening. Um, we are going to presume that you have read the book so I just wanna let you know that there will be spoilers probably throughout this. So if you were sitting there going, no, 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 don't tell me the final part, we might get to it. Is that okay, Kent? Do you think that, that that's fair to tell them that? Um, I right. More than fair, <laughs> Shannon. You know, one good, another good thing um, about this being postponed, and there weren't many of them, but um, I had originally read your book um, as the hard, uh, hardback, um, but what I did for this second one, because it had been so long, is that I had a chance to listen to the audiobook version of it. And one of the things that was um, in the audiobook is one of the things I want to talk to you about today. So I know we're going to read a little bit from the book and those other things, but can we first just start with how did you create this tender land? And I specifically uh, wanted to go over what you did for your foreword in the audiobook version, which was talk about how this wasn't originally the book that they had um, told you that you, supposed, you were supposed to write. Is that correct? Yeah, here's the story, Shannon. Since you asked. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I cut my teeth on mysteries. Before I began to write standalones, I was probably best known as the author of the, oh, I love saying this, New York Times best-selling Cork O'Connor mystery series. Another round of applause for everybody. <laughs> Feel free to put the claps in the chat. So there are currently 17, uh, 17 novels in, in the series. Um, and that's really where I developed my initial following. But about 12 years ago, a story idea came to me that wasn't a Cork O'Connor story. And when I proposed the, uh, the project to my publisher, they didn't want it. In fact, they called me out to New York City in kind of a panic and set me down and said, Kent, we only want Cork O'Connor novels from you. So I knew if I wrote this story, it was going to be a risky proposition. But it spoke to me in such a compelling way that I knew I had to write it. Uh, so across the course of the next three years, I composed the manuscript for a novel called Ordinary Grace. Now, now um, even though my publisher had told me they didn't want it, when I finished it, I went ahead and sent it to my fell in love with it, she published it, and they did. And Ordinary Grace has just had this really remarkable, really gratifying reception from critics and readers alike. It won tons of awards when it came out. It's been translated into more than two dozen foreign languages. So far, it's sold about a million copies here in the States. Uh, and when my publisher saw how well that book was doing, boy, did they want another book just like it. And I'm sure they wanted it quick. Um, it's just just so it would do as they paid me in a two years writing what I believed would be the companion novel. Now that manuscript was contractually due to my publisher five years ago. Two months before that contractual obligation, uh, I, um, I set up a meeting in Chicago to talk to my agent about revisions to the piece because there were problems with it. I knew it, she knew it. 
when we meet, I don't want to talk about how we revise this piece. I want to talk about how we, because it wasn't the, See, I had no idea how to make it that story and frankly my heart wasn't in it. Um, you know, honestly, my publisher turned out to be uh, quite understanding this and find you don't have to give us, still owe us a expectations for that follow-up novel were enormous and the whole time uh, I was trying to write the piece I just felt crushed by the weight of all those expectations and the truth is what I was doing when I was uh, writing the, the manuscript was trying to meet everybody else's expectations instead of writing the story that spoke to me from my heart. And but was that very different? Because you said that uh, Amazing Grace was definitely a heartfelt project. So do you think that that was a lot of what got in the way of that companion novel as you're going, well, I'm not writing it because I felt compelled to write it. I'm writing it because I was propelled to write it, courtesy of my... <laughs> yeah, my, my I, I had a contractual obligation I had right. to meet. But here's the thing, Shannon, as soon as all that weight got off my shoulders and I was free again, I saw the story... I should have been writing the story that did speak to me from my heart. And um, I have to tell you, it was a story I've been wanting to write since I was 11 years old. When so I was, when I was, I'm let me, be, okay. I'm just going to finish up the story here real quick. Okay. I was, mm -hmm. When I was 11 years old, that was when I was in the fifth grade, um, our teacher read to the class, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. She did it by reading half an hour after lunch every day. I love that book. Here was a kid just like me, and he was out there on the Mississippi River having these really great adventures. And of course, after that, I had to read Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which I've loved even more. And uh, an honest to God, across my entire career as a writer, I've wanted someday to write a book that would pay homage to Mark Twain. It might be in its own way an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. And that's where this Tenderland came from. And that's what I wondered when you decided when you were very young that you wanted to be an author. Is it this kind of book that you said one of these days I'm going to create a work that's like this book that we were, were talking about tonight? You know, I, uh, I never thought about that seriously. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I got into writing really because I loved ghost stories and I wanted to become a, you know, a, a writer of, of stories that would scare people, particularly kids. Um, and uh, I matured over the years and my goals in writing matured over the years um, to the point where I hoped someday I might write um, a novel that, that would have legs and maybe would outlive me. Well, we are here and this book is absolutely amazing. There were already people that were in the chat that were talking about how you were their favorite author for multiple reasons. So let's back up and actually talk about this Tenderland now. And when you talked about how it definitely is this retelling, but so much more of all of those things you said regarding Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. So let's talk specifically about this one because talk about a, a novel that is about a journey this is definitely what we get with this tender land. Yeah. So let me talk a little bit about why it's the journey that it is. I had wanted, do you know, first of all, for those people out there watching who may not have read this tender land, uh, let me give them just a little idea, a little better idea of, of the book itself. So here's the skinny on uh, this tender land. It takes place, it is set in the summer of 1932, uh, deep in the Great Depression. It's the story of four orphans running from the law because they committed a terrible crime, but for the right reason. They know if they take to the roads to get away, they're gonna be caught rather quickly because a huge manhunt has been launched to capture them. They're afraid to ride the rails as everybody was doing back in the Great Depression because the railroads back then were patrolled by private cops called bulls. And the bulls had a reputation for being incredibly cruel. So the kids are afraid to ride the rails. Instead, they decide to take to the rivers. They canoe a river called the Gilead to the Minnesota. They canoe the Minnesota to the Mississippi. And their plan is to canoe all the way down the Mississippi River to St. Louis, where they believe they have family and they'll be safe. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I knew it was gonna be a, I knew it was gonna be a journey. I wasn't quite sure. When I began, I had no idea where they were going, where they were going to end up, or even essentially why they were going there. Is that uh, very different than the mysteries that you had written before? Because I just have to presume that when you're creating those other kind of stories, 
you kind of need to know where you're going or does the story get to tell itself in that genre as well? You know, I have lots of colleagues in, uh, in the uh, crime genre uh, and everybody approaches their stories in a different way. Um, I, this is how I approach mine. For me, mysteries are such a tightly woven fabric of storytelling. Everything depends so significantly on everything else. And, and I believe that the success of a mystery depends largely on the timing of the reveals. When do you deliver to the reader the clues that are gonna be necessary for solving the mystery at the heart of it? So when I'm uh, writing a story in my Cork O'Connor series, I think that story through as significantly as I can before I ever put my, my fingers to the keyboard. At the end of that thinking process, I know how the story begins. I know how it ends. I know who did what to whom and why. I know the themes I wanna weave through this story. Um, but with this tender land, I, I, I purposefully sought a different process because I wanted this to come from my heart. I wanted the reader to feel like it was coming from my heart. And so I, uh, I only knew a few salient <laughs> elements of the story uh, before I began to write it. I knew, first of all, that it was going to be my updated version of Huckleberry Finn. Right. Now, here's something a lot of readers of uh, this tender land miss. I knew I was going to structure this story in the way that Homer structured the Odyssey. Fair enough. Every adventure that the kids had would mirror an experience that Odysseus had in his long journey from Troy back to Ithaca. And the third thing I knew about it was it was going to be set during the Great Depression. Now, one of the one of the issues I wanted to explore was the question of who we are at heart as human beings, particularly during periods of great privation or when great stress is put on our culture. You know, what, like we've been experiencing for the last year. Right. I wanted to know during these periods, are we the kind of people who uh, retreat inside ourselves and protect only that which is important to us? Or are we the kind of people who open our arms and despite how little we might have? We're willing to share it with those who have less. And I couldn't think of a better time frame to explore that issue than the Great Depression. So I knew those three things. And then I set about writing the story and I let the story guide me. I let it reveal itself to me. And it was an extraordinary experience, I have to say, Ms. Shannon. Well, thank you for the questions that are currently in the chat. We're going to get to those for just a second. So, Kent, when you talk about the journey that your protagonists in this Tenderland take, there seems to be a, a variety of journeys. There's not only the journey of actually going up the rivers, there also seems to be a spiritual journey, an emotional journey. How did you develop all of those with these main characters? You know, one of the things I love about rivers as a storyteller is just that rivers can be metaphors for so many things. And in this tender land, it's certainly a metaphor for the spiritual journey that, that Odie in particular, my narrator is on. It's also a metaphor for the journey from, uh, from childhood into the broader, sometimes sadder, wiser awareness of adulthood. Um, it's about the journey in the creation of family. How do we create family? Is it, is it all about bloodlines or are there more dynamic elements involved? And, and maybe one of the most important things is it's, a, it's about the journey to a place of forgiveness which is a difficult journey for Odie, certainly. And I think for me, sir, I'm a Scorpio, Miss Shannon. Okay. And uh, anybody who knows anything about Scorpios knows that we hold grudges. You know, we've got that stinger always poised to strike. So forgiveness has always been a difficult journey for me. And so I wanted to talk about that as well. So well, yeah, you're me not to get right. on your bad side, Kent. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing just fine so far, Shannon. <laughs> So yeah, there are lots of, of journeys uh, interwoven in the fabric of this particular story. Well, I also thought it was very interesting that you chose to make the, even though the the story is told basically as a flashback because Odie is a storyteller and so he's reliving this tale. Why did you choose to focus on the such young, young protagonists and, and main story, main characters in your story? Well, as I... Uh, it, uh, indicated earlier, this was going to be my updated version of Huckleberry Finn. Um, and uh, so everybody knows Huck Finn took the <laughs> Mississippi River. In his journey, he was accompanied by a runaway slave named Jim. Mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, when I have always imagined my version of this story, that Jim character was going to be 
a, a, a Native American kid slightly older than my protagonist. So I already had two kids at the heart of it. And then when I realized one of the things I wanted to talk about was family, I had to give Odie uh, a little bit of a family. So I created an older brother for him. Um, brother I created for Odie, his name is Albert, um, is patterned after my own oldest brother, oh, okay. who, like, who like Albert was always the smartest kid in the room and let you know it. Um, and then uh, finally there was, uh, Emmy came into my thinking. She was the last of the vagabonds to come into my thinking. And they were all young. Right. They are, these are all kids who, uh, who were fleeing a horrible environment in a Native American boarding school. Um, and so really the story is about them. Although there is a huge cast of characters that right. play a part in their lives during that summer. Well, Kent, some of the questions that we've had in the chat thus far do focus on your research process and specifically, how did you do the research regarding the Native American culture that you said it was important for you to weave into the story? Yeah, that particular part of the research um, was devastating, actually. You know, because my Cork O'Connor series, at the heart of my Cork O'Connor series is a man of mixed heritage. Cork O'Connor is part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. Um, and, uh, and so I've been working with the native community here in Minnesota for a couple of decades. And I've known for a very long time about that tragic period of our history that, uh, that um, involved the native American boarding school system. But uh, in order to create that environment uh, believably for the story, I needed to do much deeper research. Right. Now I have a lot of friends in the Native community, but most of them are at my age or younger, so they didn't go through the boarding school system themselves, but their, uh, their parents did, or their aunties and uncles did, or their grandparents did. But to a person, when I asked them to tell me about their relatives' um, accounts of their experiences, they said they will not talk about it. It was so horrific for them, they simply refused to talk about it. So I had to dig deeply to find accounts by survivors who were willing to, to talk about it. Um, and, um, and the more I dug, the more I read, the more I learned, uh, the more horrified I became, even though I had prepared myself for this. Right. And one of the other things I thought was wonderful about the audiobook version, and if people have not listened to it, you have a fantastic um, uh, narrator that you suggest you, you selected, but also the fact that you do the foreword and then do include a lot of, at least the version I had, um, includes a lot of that ancillary research that you did about it, I found very impactful. And, uh, you know, even though you didn't put all of it into a chapter in the book, to be able to relay that information, I thought was fantastic of you. So there was a lot because this takes place during the Great Depression. I have to, I have to be, uh, you know, I talk a little bit because this book is being called an historical novel, um, which makes me smile because I was born not very long after the, the Great Depression ended. <laughs> I grew up on stories that my folks told of surviving the Great Depression. My father uh, grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, during the Dust Bowl years. And so I remember him telling stories of watching it rain mud from the sky and going out to, uh, to gather wild greens to supplement what was on the dinner table. Uh, but I didn't actually grow up during the depression. So I had to do the research to make sure that my factual underpinnings were there. We are so blessed in Minnesota to have a great historical resource in the Minnesota History Center right. here in St. Paul. Inside the History Center is a section called the Gale Family Library, which is essentially an archive of every newspaper ever published in Minnesota, as well as an archive uh, of memoirs and reminiscences by those people who lived through those particular periods. So I spent hours and hours in the Gale Family Library reading those accounts, um, uh, pouring over microfilmed uh, newspapers from the day. So I, you know, I would know what fashions were like then and, uh, and what did things cost and what were the events of the day that I could build into the story. Um, and I, I, God bless the people who uh, 
put the History Center together. It's such a valuable resource for those of us who want to know our past here. Right, and I think it's wonderful as well as a as a as a person who chose Minnesota, similar to the you the way that you did, where I didn't grow up here, but I chose to live here, chose to move here, choose to raise my family here. Um, the way that you, you just had such a tender, back to the not the novel, a tender hand with the way that you described Minnesota, you could tell that you just really, really were proud to be part of this community. You know, when I was a kid, I was a nomad. I lived everywhere. Uh, I never really had anywhere that I called home. But I swear to you, when my wife and I came, first came here, I was about 30 years old. When I first set foot here, I knew I'd found home. I fell in love with this place. I fell in love with its people. And so every time I write a story set in Minnesota, whether it's one in my Cork O'Connor series up north mm -hmm. or standalone like uh, This Tender Land of Ordinary Grace set in southern Minnesota, I'm really writing a valentine to this adopted home of mine. Um, and, and because of that, you know, one of the things I love about what I do is uh, it, it allows me to travel broadly in Minnesota and then write it off as research on my taxes. Um, so I... Uh, I hope the IRS isn't listening. Um, <laughs> so I did a lot of I did a lot of geographic research for this tender land. Uh, I went down and uh, everywhere the kids uh, stop, I stopped. I visited. Um, I kayaked the Minnesota River. Uh, my wife and I together canoed the Mississippi River, that section that the kids canoe, because I wanted to know uh, what would they see on the river, what would they smell on the river, what kinds of challenges would the river throw at them. Um, there's a section of the book that takes place in Mankato at the confluence of the Blue Earth and the Minnesota River. I spent a couple of days there just kind of soaking up all of that environment. There's a scene in the book uh, where, uh, where Maybeth Schofield, Odie, Odie O'Banion's first love, she and Odie climb the hill there uh, at the confluence and sit on a rock and exchange a kiss. I sat on that rock. <laughs> Uh, I, walked, I walked the West Side Flats uh, here in St. Paul for that section. It's very different now than it was back in the 1930s when the vagabonds would have been there. But I had a map of what how the streets were laid out then. And I, I was able to figure out where Gertie's would have been and where the boat works would have been. Um, I just, I had a, a pure, it was just pure joy doing all of the research for this story. Well, it does, you can just definitely tell, it does come through that you're like, I, I felt like, I was uh, visiting a friend whenever you mentioned something and I'm like, oh yes, I, I can place where that is even today. And so it was wonderful to have that familiarity. So as the kids are starting their journey, it does seem that you are going, just like the, as we talked about the metaphor of the river, that there's just one turn after another turn after another turn that are thrust upon them. And what really, I, I forgot until you reminded me when I was reading the book that it was such a short amount of time that so much happened to them. And was that intentional to go, oh, it's only been a summer. All of this happened over <laughs> a summer. And you know, were you trying to, go, to convey that feeling of time is fleeting and things go so quickly? She, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now here is here, what I set out to do, uh, uh, Miss Shannon, was write a book that would have an epic feel to it. I wanted this to be an epic journey. I grew up. My father was a high school English teacher, and he had me uh, very early reading all of the uh, epic hero and heroine quests, uh, and I wanted this to have that feel to it. Um, and so, even though it encompasses only, essentially only um, a couple of months in, in their lives because so many adventures happen. So many people enter their lives. They're open to the world in so many different ways. It feels much larger than that. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily what I set out to do. I think that's simply um, the fallout from the kind of story that, that came to me as I was writing. Right. One of the questions we have uh, in the chat is, is the Gilead River real? <laughs> the Gilead is not real. Don't don't pull out your Minnesota map and look for it. It is not real. Um, I needed a river that would flow out of where it's uh, the the uh, template for my Lincoln, Minnesota is Pipestone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the template for my Native American boarding school was the Pipestone Indian Training School. 
Uh, but I wanted the kids to canoe a river that would take them to the Minnesota, and there really isn't one there. So I had to create a river. But it is a sit for those people who know southwestern Minnesota. Uh, my Gilead River is a combination of elements of both the Cottonwood River and the Redwood River, uh, which I traveled uh, in, in preparation for the story. Yeah. Right. So don't go looking for the Gilead. Doesn't exist. We have a, a couple of uh, specialists in the chat as well. So we have a speech pathologist who wants to know, since there was a commonality between this tender land and ordinary grace, where there were young boys that had a stutter, if there was a particular reason why you included that in both of those stories. You know, there, there is not an overarching reason. Each story I, I chose to give, um, uh, one of my characters, the challenge of speaking for a variety of reasons, but individually. So for anyone who's read this Tenderland, you know that uh, Jake, uh, the character of Jake stutters. Um, and um, I won't talk about that, but there were particular reasons I made that character stutter. But for this Tenderland, here is the reason that, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, my Native American kid, Mose, is mute. He had his tongue cut out when he was too young to remember that event. And I chose to do that for a very specific reason. I wanted Mose to stand for an entire culture that had no voice. From the late 1880s until 1978, when the National Indian Child Welfare Act was passed, if you were a Native American parent and the government came to you and said, we are going to take your children away and we're going to cart them off to a boarding school hundreds of miles distant and you will see them infrequently or maybe even never again. Right. There was absolutely nothing you could do about it. It was the law that you had to give the government your children. You had no voice. So that's why I made Mose mute. And you do really see such a transformation and I appreciate it when uh, Odie, our, our, our narrator, mentions how different they are throughout this story. And I, I it's one of those things that you realize, but to have him articulate it, where he talks about they've been with each other and they used to know each other just from a glance. And then by the time they get close to the end of their journey, they're so different because of all the things that they've happened. And I also thought that it was great the way you had a variety of characters that they came across. And it was almost, you know, I could feel a little bit of the crime writer, I thought, and there I'm going, trust no one is what I started to feel like after a while. Because whenever they got comfortable, then it did seem to get uh, taken away from them. So why was that something that we had to see those characters uh, relive over and over again? Yeah, the, the point is not trust no one. The point is don't trust the the gift that seems to be given to you right at that moment. Fair enough. Because mm -hmm. it can be taken away. The tornado god is always there, ready to strike. Um, and um, I, you know, that, so here, <laughs> I'm going to have a little trouble articulating this. Okay. Um, all of these characters that come into the, there's a reason this is called this, this tender land. Mm -hmm. okay. um, let me tell you where the title came from and then how I play that into all of the characters that enter their lives. So I didn't have a title for this for the manuscript for a very long time. And then I happened to be uh, traveling through southern Minnesota doing my geographic research for the novel. And I was listening to um, our uh, classical public radio station. And this absolutely stunningly beautiful piece of music came on that I was completely unfamiliar with. And at the end of that piece, the announcer came on and he said, you've been listening to an excerpt from the only opera Aaron Copland ever composed called and I thought he said, this tender land. The actual title of the opera is The Tender Land. Okay. But what I heard was this tender land. And I thought, thank you, Lord, there's my title. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it's, it, it really resonates uh, with the story. I have uh, at one point, one of the characters that the uh, vagabonds encounter, a guy named One-Eyed Jack, I have him deliver those words, this tender land. In a period, Jack is a drunkard, when we meet him at any rate, and he's sunk deep in this dark depression that's just eating him alive. 
But at one point he's sober, he's working the land with Odie and he's reconnecting with it in a way that he has um, through most of his life. And he talks about his belief that God isn't gonna be found in a house of worship. God is in the land. God is in the soil and in the plants and in the trees and in the stars. And sure, terrible things happen, but don't blame the land because the land gives us home. The land sustains us. And time and time again, as the vagabonds are traveling down the rivers, they're taken in by people who show them compassion, um, who treat them tenderly. And so it, seemed, it has seemed to me is such an appropriate title. And so many of those characters contribute to their growth and their understanding, and particularly Odie's journey toward a place of forgiveness. Right. And I did see that forgiveness uh, played out numerous times. I also saw, and I don't want to call it a religious bent to it, but there is definitely that spiritual journey uh, for a number of the characters. And we do kind of talk about the the typical Western God very often, but in a lot of different ways. And so I really felt that you were trying to uh, have us as the readers go along that journey and ask a lot of questions. Is that what you were trying to do, Kent? Well, I was certainly hoping that I was, in creating Odie's spiritual journey, this is really um, a story about Odie specifically in his spiritual journey. And I was hoping that it would resonate with lots of readers because I'm sure lots of readers like Odie uh, in their young years have this very Old Testament image of God, you know, a wrathful God, a smiting God, a God who can turn a whole the population of a whole city into pillars of salt. Uh, who, who can create a great flood to essentially wipe out everything on the face of the earth because he's not happy with it. Right. So Odie begins with this very, um, this tornado god image. And then he meets Sister Eve in the course of his journey. And Sister Eve offers him a different image of the divine, a loving god, a compassionate god, a forgiving god. And so Odie, across the course of that summer at 13 years of age, is trying to wrap his young understanding around the, the great mystery that is the divine. And it's a journey that he's on through his whole life, we find out at the end of the story. Right. And, uh, and I think a lot of people can, can identify with that, seeing these very divergent images of God and trying to understand the great mystery of the divine. And if anybody has any other dish questions, please put them in the chat. We'll make sure we get to as many of them as we can. And we thank everybody that's put them in so far. I really felt, because I grew up in the Southwest. And so when you got to the character of Sister Eve and really were describing this uh, revival roadshow that she had, and if you would uh, go a little deeper into that for everyone out there about how you built um this this <laughs> revival road show and i i remember going oh okay i remember my grandma taking me to those because they were still a few of them that would pop up and i remember there being in arizona all of a sudden there would be a tent and it's not a circus <laughs> it, we're gonna go see a circus. okay yeah. grandma, i got it yeah it's not a circus but it's definitely a show yeah um the Sword of Gideon Healing Crusade is Sister Eve's tent revival show. And, you know, I told you my father uh, grew up in Oklahoma. He grew up in a family that was very fundamental in its approach to religion. So uh, he went to lots of tent revivals when he was a kid. He was saved many times. <laughs> and I loved his stories about that experience. And although, you know, I have never had a, uh, been to a tent revival myself, I always knew someday I'm going to write I'm going to write this into one of my stories, and this just seemed like the perfect opportunity. Um, so what I you know I had to do my my research for uh, for the sort of Gideon Healing Crusade, and I just found it fascinating. I don't know how many people out there know this, but um, in the late uh, in the in the early 20th century, in the 19 early 1900s, a huge evangelical revival movement swept the entire country from coast to coast. Right. There were tent revivals everywhere. By the time the uh, you know such such names as uh, Billy Sunday or Amy Semple McPherson came out of these movements, uh, by the time that the um, that the uh, vagabonds take to the river in 1932, that movement had pretty much died out in most of the country, but it was still very powerful in the South and very powerful in the Midwest. So, you know, I did my research, but I have to be honest with you and with, uh, with readers out there. My 
creation of the Sword of Gideon Healing Crusade, really I owes a huge debt of gratitude to Sinclair Lewis and his novel, Elmer Gantry. Oh, okay. Sinclair Lewis was known as an assiduous researcher. Um, so he traveled with, uh, with tent revivals when he was going to write Elmer Gantry. Now, for those of you who have never read Elmer Gantry, or it's been so long since you read it, you don't really remember it. Elmer Gantry is a con man, and he uses religion to his own selfish ends. At one point in the novel, he takes up with a tent revival a uh, tent revivalist named Sharon Falconer, who's just an intriguing character. Um, she's a woman of the world. She smokes, she drinks, she carouses with uh, Elmer. But she is also a woman who believes profoundly that God has tapped her to deliver a loving message to the world. And I've always found her such a wonderfully complex character. My thinking about Sister Eve really began with Sharon Falconer. So uh, Sinclair Lewis, if you're up there or down there or wherever listening, uh, thank you so much, Guy. <laughs> So we are going to go back to the chat. So um, I see a number of them that are grouped together regarding some Native American cultural questions. So let's do those all at one time. So before we get to those, um, a different outlier we have on this question is, how did you decide to give Emmy her powers to alter the future? Yeah, Emmy, is, uh, Emmy was one of the most difficult characters for me to write. Um, pretty much for that reason. I, Emmy came late to my thinking as a vagabond. I created Emmy initially simply to be a daughter for Cora Frost, one of the teachers at the Native American boarding school, because I saw Cora as a woman who would have a, a daughter like Emmy. But the more I wrote Emmy into the story, the more I just fell in love with her. And when it came time for the boys to run away from the boarding school, I thought, crap, they're gonna leave Emmy in a horrible situation. They can't do that. So I knew Emmy was gonna to have to go with them on this journey of theirs. And I needed, uh, I needed a part for Emmy to play. Now, I told you my father was a high school English teacher and, um, and he had me reading all of the hero and heroine quests. Well, one of the things I, I remember reading from, uh, from all that reading, one of the things I remember is, is that very often on a hero or a heroine's quest, he or she is accompanied by a seer, somebody who can actually look into the future and offer advice, whether it's taken or not. So I decided I was going to make Emmy my seer. Now, that was not at all a leap in belie believability for me, because Miss Shannon, my mother was a seer. Oh, I'm not going to... Hey, I'm not doubting you. I have had lots of things happen in my life. There you go. Yes. Well, my, when I was a kid, my mother, um, it was not unusual for the telephone to ring and, and mom would go, it's Aunt Joanne and there's trouble. And sure enough, it was Aunt Joanne and there was right. trouble. Or she would toss and turn in bed for several nights in a row and she would say, something terrible is coming, something terrible is coming. And sure enough, something terrible came. So making Emmy a seer was not a, 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 a leap in believability at all for me. I feel now, does she really tweak the future that she sees? If you remember the end of the story, almost the final paragraph, I have Odie say, and it, in, uh, in every good story, there is a seed of truth. And from that seed of truth, the story grows. If you have trouble buying some of the story, a woman who can with a touch, know your history, a girl who can see into the future and maybe change it a little, then just accept it as one of the blossoms, one of the blooms on the rose bush. Right. So you gave everybody who just had to be a naysayer an out. There you go. That, that maybe Obi, Odie was just waxing poetic. And I appreciated that. I but, but I have to say this, I firmly believe, and this is essentially Odie's final statement in this story, I firmly believe that we should open our hearts to every possibility because there's nothing our hearts can imagine that is not so. I agree with you. And I, you know, again, I grew up in that combination of uh, religion and voodoo. So I, a little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, so I, you can talk to my grandma on that side, Mr. Harkin. So yes, yes. Um, so, I mean, I think that we um, should dive a little deeper into some, we've had a number of questions about um, the way that you handled not only your research about the Native American community but for instance how was the story um how did they relate to the story or how was it received by them do you know i haven't that's a very good question and i have yet 
to hear from uh, someone in the native uh, community, a native reader, uh, about their reaction to the story. You know, I, I, I did a, just an enormous amount of research. I did due diligence in creating uh, the Native American boarding school, uh, that environment. But I have yet to hear from uh, anybody regarding that. I hear from uh, Native readers all the time about my Corporal Connor work, mm -hmm. uh, which is really even uh, more heavily steeped in the culture of the Ojibwe, uh, but not for this tender land so far. Right. Okay. Well, that's fair. And I, um, I know we were going to go a little deeper into certain parts of the book. So you had offered to read the prologue, I believe. So are yeah. you willing to do that for us? Oh, I love reading this prologue. Okay. And I love reading the prologue for two reasons, Miss Shannon. First of all, it's very short. It's just a little over a page long. But the other reason I love to read the prologue is that honest to God, I love this prologue. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is how I bring readers into this tender land. In the beginning, after he labored over the heavens and the earth, the light and the dark, the land and sea and all living things that dwell therein, after he created man and woman, and before he rested, I believe God gave us one final gift. Lest we forget the divine source of all that beauty, he gave us stories. I am a storyteller. I live in a house in the shade of a sycamore tree on the banks of the Gilead River. My great-grandchildren, when they visit me here, call me old. Old is a cliché, I tell them with mock disappointment, a terrible trivializing and insult. I was born along with the sun and earth and moon and planets and all the stars. Every atom of my being was there at the very beginning. You're a liar, they scowl but playfully. Not a liar, a storyteller, I remind them. Then tell us a story, they plead. I need no goading, stories of the sweet fruit of my existence, and I share them gladly. The events I'm about to share with you began on the banks of the Gilead. Even if you grew up in the heartland, you may not remember these things. What happened in the summer of 1932 is most important to those who experienced it, and there are not many of us left. The Gilead is a lovely river, lined with cottonwoods already ancient when I was a boy. Things were different then, not simpler or better, just different. We didn't travel the way we do now, and for most folks in Fremont County, Minnesota, the world was limited to the piece of it they could see before the horizon cut off the land. They wouldn't have understood any more than I did that if you kill a man, you are changed forever. If that man comes back to life, you are transformed. I have witnessed this and other miracles with my own eyes. So among the many pieces of wisdom life has offered me over all these years is this, open yourself to every possibility for there is nothing your heart can imagine that is not so. The tale I'm going to tell is of a summer long ago of killing and kidnapping and children pursued by demons of a thousand names. There will be courage in this story and cowardice. There will be love and betrayal and of course, there will be hope. In the end, isn't that what every good story is about? Thanks for asking me to read. Absolutely wonderful. I might put you on the spot and have you read one final thing when we wrap up, because I know what I would have you read. Okay. At the end of the book, because okay. you were so good at it. And I was actually surprised, and we have somebody else who said they heard the uh, uh, audio book as all, and actually enjoyed the use of music that you used in that as well. Um, I also, after, since you did it, I thought that the, the narrator that you did was wonderful, but I'm like, Kent could have done this too. And that's oh. somebody who's a voice talent. So I'm never trying to put me and my other actor friends out of work, but some authors I'm like, oh, they, they got it. They've got it. So you, you know, I have to tell you, honestly, I, uh, I auditioned to read my own work many, many years ago and they turned me down. <laughs> I can you know, see that. Uh, so those, those people who, 
those people who read for a living oh yeah who do it professionally i mean it's a form of genius imagine creating a unique voice for every character in the story and maintaining that voice across the whole course of the work that's just genius yes i have some friends some of my actor friends who are who are very good at doing that and then every once in a while somebody asks me if i want to do one i'm like I no no <laughs> no I leave it to the professional so but you actually do a wonderful job um one of the other questions we got here is if could you give us some examples of parallels between this novel and the Odyssey oh absolutely I can the it may seem odd the decision uh to open this story in a Native American boarding school but when I was thinking uh, about the Odyssey for those of you who've read the Odyssey where does Odysseus begin his journey? He begins in Troy, which is um, a place where hor horrible things have happened. And I couldn't think of a more horrific environment for these kids to be running from than a Native American boarding school. Um, the first person they meet is a guy named One-Eyed Jack, a farmer who sort of imprisons them. And uh, again, he has one eye. If you remember your Odyssey, um, Odysseus and his men get caught by Polyphemus, the Cyclops, has one eye. And how does Odysseus escape Polyphemus? He gets him drunk and he puts his eye out. So there's the, the first, um, the second actual correlation. Uh, next he meets Sister Eve. Now Odysseus, in the course of his journey, meets a sorceress named Circe. Mm -hmm. who can turn beasts into men and men into beasts. And if you remember how Odie meets Sister Eve, he watches a tent revival show in which some beasts of men threaten her and she tames them. Right. So she's my Circe. The next stop is with, uh, he meets Maybeth Schofield uh, and the Schofield family in the uh, Hopersville. Odysseus in his journey meets a sorceress named Calypso and he falls deeply in love with Calypso and she falls deeply in love with him and Calypso almost seduces Odysseus away from his journey home mm -hmm. just as Maybeth almost seduces Odie away from his journey. Um, then they reach the West Side Flats where people, despite horrific circumstances, not horrific, but difficult circumstances, have found a way to, to create community and be happy. The Lotus Eaters. Mm -hmm. And then where does Odysseus end up? Where is home for Odysseus? Ithaca Street. So there you go. Absolutely wonderful. Here's another quick one. They want to know if you are Odie. Odie and I are kindred spirits. We're bound up with one another. Okay. Um, yeah, Odie, Odie is my favorite character I have ever created because Odie just comes so much out of my heart, so much out of who I am and all of the things I wish I'd been when I was a kid like Odie. He had a lot of moxie. You oh, know, he did, he did. He had a quick tongue and a quick mind. You know, he's rebellious, uh, pushes back against authority. I was kicked out of Stanford University at the end of my first year there. Wait, tell Remember? everyone that story. I saw that I, I I saw that on your website, and then I went and I found another interview where you talked about that because I was curious. So can you tell all of our viewers that story about you getting kicked out of Stanford? <laughs> sure. Thank you. I mean, I matriculated at Stanford University in the fall of 1969. We were deep in the Vietnam War at that point. For those of you who are old enough to remember the war well, uh, the spring of 1970 was the spring of the shootings on the Kent State campus in Ohio. Um, it was the spring we discovered that, they, that uh, uh, our, in, in so many ways, our government had been lying to us. And in addition to Vietnam, we're carrying on um, uh, wars in Cambodia and uh, secret wars in Cambodia and Laos. Stanford University at that point in time had an um, association with an, uh, an organization called the Stanford Research Institute, SRI, whose primary source of income then was the production of military weaponry or research into the production of military weaponry. And there were a lot of us at Stanford that felt that was an inappropriate relationship for an institution like Stanford to maintain, particularly at that point in history. So we petitioned the trustees to sever the relationship. We petitioned the administration. We marched, we demonstrated. Yeah, nobody listened to us because there was of course, huge amounts of money involved. So in frustration, finally, a group of us marched into the administration building one day and occupied it. 
Uh, the president of the university, a guy named Richard Lyman, was pretty reasonable. He said, I'm not going to give me any trouble. He vacated the building and we took it over. That night at eight o'clock, we had a band come in and we held a dance where typically we would have all registered for classes. Okay. And at midnight, at midnight, the band packed up and took off. And those of us who were going to occupy the building rolled out our sleeping bags and went to sleep. Huge logistical error because at one in the morning, the Palo Alto riot squad swept through and arrested us all. I was on a full scholarship to Stanford. It evaporated and I had to leave. But that seemed to work out just like the story eventually worked out for our friend Odie. Yeah, I met the woman I eventually married uh, just just after the uh, the occupation. Yeah. So you needed a little hope as well. So <laughs> there we go. Do you know every good story is about hope in the end? <laughs> we have a couple of other questions here that are based upon uh, not specifically this tender land, but more about your process as an author. So some people would like to know what inspires you to write. It's like specifically, is it that you have a message that you need to get out, or is it just delight of telling a good story? You know, it's both. I typically, when I write a story in my Cork O'Connor series, very often there is a social issue about which I feel strongly at the heart of the story. And so I create a construct around that issue. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is, is that I can put, I can talk about important social issues in, in my story so long as I couch them within a good compelling mystery. And, um, and uh, even people who don't necessarily agree with my point of view will still read me. <laughs> I, I do occasionally get emails from readers telling me, complaining that, that my admittedly liberal bleeding heart sensibilities find their way into my stories, but I've never had anybody tell me they're not going to read me because of it. And Miss Shannon, how often is it that you have an opportunity to stand up on a soapbox and spout off without giving the other side an opportunity for rebuttal? I love that about what I do. That's, hey, I'm a stand-up comedian. I have the <laughs> microphone. Nobody else does. They can shout from the audience all day. So I agree with so sometimes, sometimes the stories come from that. Sometimes they're stories that have been with me for a very long time. They've gestated and finally come to the place where I, I believe I know how to tell this story now. And I will, like this tender land. And how have you stayed motivated throughout your career? I know that it's got to be one of those things where you're constantly going, how do I stay motivated? What's my process? How do I keep, you have so many um, books in your personal library. How do you keep coming up with all this material? How I keep coming up with all the material is a different question than how do I stay enthusiastic about what I'm doing? And you know the answer to that. You know the answer to that because you are enthusiastic about what you do. And why? Because we're doing what we love to do most in the world. I get up Every morning, seven days a week, I get up about six o'clock and I spend the first two or three hours of the day writing. Every day I begin with what I love most in this world. So when you do that, some people want to know, can you tell us what you're working on now? So what I you just, Yeah, I just uh, completed the, what I'm uh, sure are the final revisions for the next book in my Cork O'Connor series. It's a novel called Lightning Strike. Right? all wanted to know. Uh, oh, good. Lightning, for those for those of you who are excited and wondering, Lightning Strike number 18 in my Cork O'Connor series will be out in August. It's a prequel to the series. It, uh, if For those of you who, uh, who are familiar with the Cork O'Connor series, you may remember that Cork O'Connor was sheriff of Tamarack County at one point. And when Cork was a kid, his father was sheriff of Tamarack County and his father was killed in the line of duty. Lightning Strike takes Cork in the summer before his father is killed in the line of duty. And I create a mystery in that time. And what it's allowed me to do is, um, is explore the, the important relationship that Cork had with his father, the relationship Cork had with his mother, the relationship his parents had with one another, these important relationships that shaped Cork into the man who occupies center stage in the series. It's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. I absolutely believe you. I was sold the minute you started talking about prequel. I was already on board. So they also want to know, have your readers from the Cork O'Connor mystery series been receptive to your standalone no novels? You know, that was a huge question for me um, when, I, uh, when I wrote uh, Ordinary Grace, which was the com first standalone companion novel to This Tender Land. And um, because of that, I spent 
uh, when I was touring for Cork O'Connor for about three years in advance of the release of that particular novel, every time I did an event, I would prepare readers. I'm coming out with a novel that is not a Cork O'Connor story, but you should read it because it's great. Um, and in fact, then readers did follow me to uh, Ordinary Grace. And, and I've had the reverse true. People who wouldn't necessarily read a mystery will read This Tender Land or Ordinary Grace. And because they enjoy um, what I do as a storyteller, they give my Cork O'Connor series a try. And I can't tell you the number of emails I get from readers who say, you know, I read This Tender Land, decided to give your series a try. I love Cork O'Connor, you know, I, and I, what a pleasure I, it is to hear that, you know? <laughs> the synergy is all working itself. Yeah. Another question we have is they said, living in Minnesota this year has been so hard on so many levels. Will you use this time period in a story? You know, I have no plans at the moment because I don't know what this period in time will have taught us. I think um, I, for one, need some distance to be able to look back and figure out what went on and why it went on and what did we all learn from it? How were we changed by it? Uh, I'm sure there are my, many of my colleagues who are currently at work using the pandemic uh, as, a, as a foundation for their story. That's not gonna be me for a while. So they wanna know why is Tenderland and Ordinary Grace considered companion novels? Yeah, I, have, I began talking about uh, this Tenderland as a companion novel to Ordinary Grace a very long time ago because I wanted people to understand it is this Tenderland was not going to be a sequel. It would not deal with the same characters. Mm -hmm. I've called them companion novels for these reasons. First of all, both of them are set in Southern Minnesota rather than the Northern Minnesota of my Cork O'Connor series. Both are set in an earlier time. Ordinary Grace is set in the summer of 1961. This Tenderland is set in the summer of 1932. And they are both, um, they are both companion in that they deal with many of the same themes. The importance of the spiritual journey in our lives. Um, family, the forces that seek to divide family and the forces that hold them together. Um, uh, the importance of forgiveness in our lives. So, so many themes uh, are interwoven in both stories that I, I always refer to them as companion novels. And I always tell People, if you've read This Tender Land but never read Ordinary Grace, you should, because you're going to see so many. If you liked what I did with uh, This Tender Land, I think you'll like what I did with Ordinary Grace and vice versa. And they want to know also, do you have any other independent novels on the horizon? Well, um, I'm uh, within spitting distance of finishing up what will be number 19 in my Cork O'Connor series, a novel that will be called Jawbone Creek and will be out in the fall of 2022. And this summer then, I hope I am able to clear all the decks and begin focusing on the third standalone that will be a companion to both this Tenderland and to Ordinary Grace. That won't be out for a while. I, I have a two year deadline on that one. Which is wonderful for another question that we have in our Q and A. They wanna know, is it easier for you to write a story for a single book or is it easier for you to construct a story that spans a whole series? You know, there are advantages and disadvantages to both kinds, to, to a standalone and to a series. Advantages of a series, of course, is, is that I don't have to go back and recreate the wheel every time. I've already established characters that readers are familiar with, a location that readers feel at home, uh, elements that readers expect in, in a Cork O'Connor story. I know all of those things. So those are um, they're fairly easy for me to create and to write and, and to continue to enjoy because I know that's what readers would like. Um, some of the disadvantages of a series is people expect that's what you're going to do. Right. You're not, you're not always free to do something different. Um, I love the standalones because that's the freedom I have. I can do anything I want to. There are no uh, expectations at this point uh, for what I'm going to deliver. Uh, and I just love that freedom. I try not to for all of my favorite authors as well, where I read all of their series, just like your Cork O'Connor. I try not to be that fan that writes to you and says, why did you do this with this character? <laughs> I'm like, stop it. You need to trust their process. It'll all be fine. So I hope you don't get a lot of those emails as well. When people oh, I get a lot of those emails. <laughs> you know, and that, that's okay, Shannon, because the truth is, and every storyteller knows this, 
you tell the story and once it's out there, it's not your story anymore. People bring their own uh, perceptions, expectations, prejudices, whatever to the story, and it becomes theirs. Well, I know that people are very, very attached to all of these things. One of the things that I liked about this tender land as well is I'm one of those people that gets very emotionally invested in the characters right away. Like I'm very empathetic, even though I know that they're fictional. So the fact that you at least took a little pressure off of me by having ODB the narrator, I'm like, well, I know he's here because he's telling the story. So there you no go. how tense it got for him, I'm like, he must make it. <laughs> now you're astute, you picked that up. A lot of readers don't really get that. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, that's how I made it to the end. I'm like, just stick with it. Odie will make it. He'll at be least okay. Odie makes it. At least Odie made it, yeah. And, and, yeah, and you did, there was, I was very, very impressed with the, there, there were so many twists, like when we met a new character and when we layered, like they were such, I call them all onions. Like there were so many layers to pull back on all of your primary characters in the story where when one eye Jack comes back up, he's a slightly different character, but we still don't know whether we can trust it. Um, when we see Sister Eve again, she seems slightly different, but we don't know why she's here. When we finally get to the point that we meet Odie's mother and, you know, and, and, and we get to St. Louis, we're like, I was just amazed with the way that every twist seemed appropriate and I never felt like you twisted it just to twist it. I didn't feel like it was an M. Night Shyamalan twist. It was, <laughs> okay. I wasn't expect, there. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, ex I wasn't expecting it, but it all completely made sense when I was looking at Odie's journey where I'm like, of course it's not that easy for him. He made, he made it to St. Louis. Of course it's difficult. That's life for him. And then once you said, you know, when you talked about the fact that maybe there was some embellishments, we're not sure which ones were embellishments and which were and weren't. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. Yeah, that's uh, twenty years of uh, being a published storyteller at work there. Well, there is, I'm, I'm impressed. I was well, there, there is um, that point in time when you begin to trust yourself and all of your instincts as a storyteller. I told you the story revealed itself to me, and I just followed where it led. Well, we have a couple of questions about Ordinary Grace, your other book, your other standalone book. Um, one, they would like to know, is there any talk of a TV series for Ordinary Grace? Yeah, the, uh, the rights to Ordinary Grace have been uh, optioned and a, and a uh, script is being written now, a multi-part series uh, that will be um, offered to a number of the streaming platforms. I'm supposed to be seeing within the next few weeks uh, the the first of the scripts or the I hope I'm going to be able to see all of them uh, but we'll see so yeah that is in at the moment in the offing and also um, we had someone mention that they love the characters from Ordinary Grace as well and that their favorite was Frank and they wonder if you might bring him back to tell you know what? yeah I, I get that a lot uh, and, and the answer is no I told Frank Drum's story and Jake's story the Drum family story um, and, uh, and I was ready to move on. So I have moved on. I think you'll really appreciate this comment as well, Kent. Someone's mentioned that they moved to Minnesota two years ago and did not know much about the history of the indigenous people here. And that thanks to your books, they have a new insight into their history, culture, family, and respect for our land. I'm so happy to hear that. You know, um, for so many years, the history we were taught was uh, false history. And I'm so pleased to see that history being revised, uh, the truth actually being taught to, uh, to our school kids these days. Regarding those themes that were from the 1930s to parallel them to the themes that you think we should be covering now, are there specific things that you go, this is what I would like people to start a conversation about or continue a conversation about? You know, one of the takeaways from this Tenderland might be the more things change, the more they stay the same. I set this book at a time when we were, we had a huge homeless population. What do we have now? 
I said it in a time when there were people desperately seeking jobs that would pay a livable wage. What do we have now? I said it in a time when we had a huge economic and social divide in our nation. What do we have now? We are dealing with the same issues we were dealing with then. And I just have to keep asking myself, have we learned anything? I don't know. We need to continue to have these conversations, Ms. Shannon, because if we stop having them, we are, um, we're hopeless. Right. And I even say some of these conversations, if it's not for wonderful authors like you, we're not even, ha st we haven't had some of these conversations. And so thank you to our, our, our commenter in the chat that said that they've learned a lot because I do think it is wonderful that there are people like you, Kent, that are out there going, no, 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 let me showcase the story. Here's something that might be painful, but we still need to cover it. You need to know that this happened so that we can actually have change. And so people can go, well, in my uncomfortability, I can actually make strides and we yeah. can figure out a way to come together. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And we are seeing lots of people actually stepping up and, um, and doing the hard work of getting all of us to listen more. We, right, th then it's incumbent on the rest of us to listen. Right. Kent, we have a couple of personal questions out here. They're not too personal, though. They're personal-ish. So first of all, <laughs> people would like to know what you do in your free time when you're not writing. Free time? What is that? <laughs> Fair enough. No, I, uh, I uh, love bike riding and we are getting to the point back in Minnesota now when I can take my bike out for, um, for the, the biking that I just love to do. I'm a tennis player, so I get out on the courts whenever I can. Um, I walk with my wife a lot. We garden. Um, I have a grandson. I try to, even though he is now, he's almost 16 and his grandfather is not his favorite person in the world anymore. I'm, I'm still there, but I'm not the favorite guy anymore. So I try to spend as much time with my grandson as I can. He'll come back around. That's what everybody I know. Me. I know. I have a 13 year old and he's all like, bye mom. Like right now he's out with his auntie. <laughs> he had no friends, but me now he's like, well, whatever. Mom. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> but everybody tells me they all come back around, especially when they're you're, you'll be favorite grandpa again. You'll be favorite. Yeah. Again. They also would like to know what, do you like to read? Do you know what I like to read and what I read are two different things. Um, the vast majority of my reading these days are what are called ARCs, advanced readers copies or bound galleys of books that are gonna be available to, uh, to folks to purchase uh, not for many, 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 many months. And I've been asked to read them with an eye to offering what's called a blurb, a dust jacket quote. You know, you've seen uh, on the cover of book, uh, Stephen King says, this is the best thing since the Bible. Right. Um, yeah, well, um, established authors were kind enough to give me dust jacket quotes when I broke in and it's a way that we pay back. So I read an enormous number of those. Um, when I, if I have to say the vast majority of my reading, my free time reading, those that I would choose to read are audiobooks. I, I listen to them while I'm traveling, while I'm uh, exercising, while I'm doing other things. Um, and, uh, oh, you know, I've just, I've been reading a lot of books about the Great Depression, I have to tell you. Uh, there's a great book out there right now, Kristen Hanna, her new novel called uh, The Four uh, Winds, uh, about the families during the Dust Bowl uh, trying to survive. It's just a stunning evocation of that time. Another book, also said in the Great Depression, uh, dealing with orphans is a book called Before We Were Yours by Lisa Wingate. Just a, a, a terrific story. So those are two that I would recommend right now. I think it's wonderful that you are promoting audiobooks as well. I always thought, I tried really hard to tell myself I didn't want audiobooks and I didn't want Kindle books. I was like, no, you need to be old school and you like the tangibility. And then one day when my kid was younger, I finished the book I was reading in the middle of the night and ran out a book. And I'm like, well, I can't go to the bookstore right now. So what can I do? And I downloaded an electronic copy of the next book and I've been hooked ever, ever since. Ever yeah, since. you know, as a writer, uh, I don't care how people come to my work, whether it's <laughs> audio or eBooks or the, you know, hard copy of the book. I just want them to come to my work and enjoy it. 
Wonderful. All right. We're about 15 minutes out, so I encourage everybody to continue to put their questions and their comments into the chat so we can make sure that we get to as many of them as we can before we wrap up this evening. And okay, Ken, I want to let you is and this is probably I know you have kids and so you can't pick your favorite kid. Is there a favorite portion of this tender land like where you go this this chapter, this part, I mean, we talked about the prologue, but is there something in there where you're like, when we get to this, it really kicked in and I was grooving? Um, yeah. My favorite, aside from Odie, my favorite character in this story is Sister Eve. Okay. And had just both a delightful and spiritually satisfying experience writing the, uh, the section that deals with the sort of Gideon healing crusade. Um, there were a lot of things about how that played out and the importance in, to Odie and the rest of the, his journey that just satisfied me tremendously. But I have to tell you this, I also love the ending because it was a total surprise to me. I had no idea it was gonna end the way it did. Um, and, uh, and I, I'm appreciative of my storytelling sensibilities that allowed me to spin the web in the way that I spun it at that point. I did not see it coming. And again, spoilers for everyone out there. I did not see that coming at all, but it did, it, it, in, and again, I just presumed it was the mystery writer in you. It did pull everything together that I'm like, I saw that breadcrumb and didn't know that it had anything to do with this. It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And I think that, you know, and I'm sure that people, because we're all judgmental, I know when I'm reading a book, if I go at the end and I'm going, yeah, that end, I earned that end. Everything about that end wrapped it up. You don't feel, you know, I, I didn't feel like I was still hungry. <laughs> Yeah, I love a book like that, too. I love a story that leaves me really satisfied, that makes me feel I've been on a journey and I am so happy where I've been brought. I really appreciated that you gave us an epilogue as well. And that ending was so good that if you didn't even give us that epilogue, I still would have been happy. You know, it was <laughs> nice to know what else that happened with the characters, but it, it still was OK. And I'm going to eventually I would love you to just read like the first paragraph of the epilogue when we wrap up. So I'm just giving sure. you just letting you know so that it doesn't spring on you. So yep. let's see, we have some other comments in here. So they would like to know, how frequently are you in Aurora, Minnesota? <laughs> yeah, I get to Aurora about once a decade. Okay. <laughs> the real Aurora. My Aurora for the Cork O'Connor series is a fictional town that is a, a combination of so many elements of the Northwoods towns that I have grown to love over the years. So. If you travel up to Aurora, Minnesota to look at it because you think that's my Aurora, you will probably be a little disappointed. Aurora, the real Aurora, it's a nice town, but it's not my Aurora. Fair enough. Um, also, we have another comment slash question. Um, they say um, their family of readers enjoy your book and that their brother is a retired Lutheran pastor and commented that your theology in this tender land and ordinary grace followed separate paths. And did you even think that it was theological when you were writing these stories? No, I wasn't. I'm not a theologian. Um, I was just writing out of my own beliefs, what I have observed, what I have experienced, what I've felt. Um, so it was, you know, if it's if it doesn't ring true for you, let it go. Fair enough. Fair enough. Typically, how many pages do you write in the morning? You know, I never set a page goal. Um, I set a time. I write for two or three hours. And usually I try to write to a point where I'm tired. I have uh, done what I need to do for the day. And I try to leave it knowing exactly where I want to pick up tomorrow. So when I sit down at six o'clock in the morning to write, I don't have to think, oh, God, what a What's going to happen next? What do I want to write next? I, you know, I borrowed that uh, actually from Ernest Hemingway, one of my early influences. Um, and what I knew about Hemingway was is that, well, first of all, he got up at, at first light and wrote, which is one of the reasons I do. But he also would try to leave himself at the end of a day, knowing what he was going to write the next day. In fact, so much so 
that he would often leave off in the middle of a sentence, okay. knowing exactly how he was going to end that sentence the next day, and that would take him into his work. Does that help you get this right back into the process sooner? Because you're going, I don't have to sit here and ruminate on where I'm going next. Absolutely, it does. I haven't lost the, the thread of the energy. Are there any stories, like you talked about how this tender land was something that you had been thinking about since you were 11. Are there any other stories that you're going, one day I'm going to write X that you can give us a little taste of? Uh, I'm going to say yes, the answer is yes, but no, I'm not going to give you a taste of it. And for this reason, my next standalone novel, I have a sense of what I want to write. But again, my, uh, my uh, early inspiration, Hemingway, Hemingway believed you shouldn't talk about a story while you're writing it uh, because you talk out the energy of the story. So I won't say anything about the next project, except that it will also be set in the Minnesota River Valley, the same territory that the Vagabonds traverse, and that is the setting for Ordinary Grace. Um, it will be, it, it will involve a family across many years, and it will probably deal with many of the same things that I dealt with in uh, Ordinary Grace in this Tenderland. That's about all I'm gonna say at this moment. All right, a follow-up question regarding your inspiration. They want to know, can you describe how you're inspired? Like, how does the story get in your heart? And do you ever have, like, dreams about story themes or songs that inspire you? You know, I almost, I can't recall ever having dreamed a part of one of my stories. Um, I don't know, aren't most people's dreams too wild? <laughs> actually understand and make a coherent story out of um, and where the inspiration comes from you know the truth is is that um, I think when you accept that you are one of the storytellers it's like you open a door to yourself and stories just start coming from all directions they come from places you would expect they come from places you would never expect and in the end, the question is, what right now inspires me so much that I know I can spend at least a year with this project? And for the longer ones, it has to, it has to inspire me even more because I know I'm going to spend two or even three years with the story. So that's the essential. What inspires me at that point in time? They also want to know, how do you keep your notes? Like, do you keep notes on your writing sessions? And what's your method for keeping track of your process? notes wouldn't that be a good idea <laughs> fair enough you know i uh i've been a storyteller for so long now that uh, i have no trouble keeping everything in, just in my in the file cabinet in my head uh, every once in a while that screw up you know I, i'm out biking and i and a great idea comes to me i'm going oh i know i know i bike 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 i get home and i go what the hell was that idea you know <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> Fair enough. I've had that where I've like woken up in the middle of the night going, this will be a great joke. I'll remember it tomorrow. <laughs> All I can remember, I'm like, it would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a couple other questions. I know we only have about five minutes left. They want to know, do you like writing in coffee shops? That's where I have always written, Miss Shannon. Okay. Um, until the pandemic made it uh, difficult for us to do that. Impossible, really. Uh, yeah, for 40 years, my alarm clock has gone off at uh, a little before six. I've gotten myself up, dressed, and I've gone to a coffee shop. That's where I, all my novels, with the exception of the last two manuscripts, which I wrote during the pandemic, have been created. You know, that started uh, process started many, many, many years ago when my wife entered law school and I became the sole support of the family. Um, but I wanted to be a writer. And so I had to come up with a way to write and still meet my responsibilities to the family. We were living two blocks from this iconic cafe in St. Paul, a place called the St. Clair Broiler that opened its doors at six o'clock every morning. So I pitched this idea to my wife. I said, Diane, if you're willing to get the kids up and fed and dressed and off to school so I can go right first thing in the morning, I swear to you, when I come home at the end of the day from my job, I will be the best husband, the best father you can possibly imagine. She bought it. So there I was every morning at six o'clock with my pen and notebook in hand uh, and writing. So writing in the coffee shop became a part of the magic of the creation. 
And I know that you were incredibly busy and out on tour doing a lot of live events, promoting your books and those things before everything shut down. How has your schedule changed now that we're doing so many things virtually? And are you excited to get back out and about? You know, the, the, uh, one of the things that the pandemic, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that we, we all of my events couldn't be in person. In fact, none of my events could be in person. Mm -hmm. And so I began uh, doing virtual visits with book clubs, which is something I could never visit. I could never accept all the invitations I got to visit book clubs because there were just so many. But now I can do that because I just, I'm in the comfort of my own home and I just visit them virtually. Uh, across the last year since the pandemic uh, settled on us, I have Zoomed with about 250 book clubs. Um, and that has just been a tremendously, um, actually a tremendously satisfying experience because I found as our conversation here, you can have a good connection, a kind of an intimate sense um, at the end of one of these virtual meetings. That said, I am so eager to get back to in-person events. Right now I'm planning the tour for my next novel, that'll be out in August in all of the bookstores I'm talking to, we are planning in-person signings unless something drastic happens with the pandemic to change that. But I think we're looking at herd immunity by then. We may still have to mask up, but we can gather again in a way that we haven't been for a very long time. So I'm planning an in-person tour for- uh, Please do some good social distancing and come out and get your yeah, book signed in Exactly, person. exactly. That'll be fantastic. So I'm going to make sure that we give out your website and all that information, but uh, I already gave you a heads up. Do you mind reading just as we wrap up a little bit of the epilogue for us? Because it is just another one of those really beautiful passages. Even if you gave us just the first, um, before we were, were take, I, in my head, I hear you reading um, until we actually get into what the actual characters do, but just that first part. Okay. Here's, uh, here's the here's the first the very brief first section of the epilogue and it, it harks back to Odie's spiritual journey so profoundly there is a river that runs through time in the universe vast and inexplicable a flow of spirit that is at the heart of all existence and every molecule of our being is a part of it and what is God but the whole of that river when I look back at the summer of 1932, I see a boy not quite 13 doing his best to pin God down, to corral that river and give it a form he could understand. Like so many before him, he shaped it and reshaped it and shaped it again, and yet it continued to, to defy all his logic. I would love to be able to call out to him and tell him in a kindly way that reason will do him no good, that it's pointless to rail about the difficulty of the twists in that river and that he shouldn't worry about where the current will take him. But I confess that even after more than 80 years of living, I still struggle to understand what I know in my heart is a mystery beyond human comprehension. Perhaps the most important truth I've learned across the whole of my life is that it's only when I yield to the river and embrace the journey that I find peace. Why don't we call it there? That is absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. On behalf of One Book, One Lakeville, we appreciate everyone who joined us this evening, and we hope that you will all keep in contact. We are already discussing next year's event that we also hope will be in person, so please keep up with everything that we have going on. I also want to encourage you to support the Friends of the Lakeville Heritage Library by making a, don a donation. Just go to our website, heritagelibraryfriends.com. That's heritagelibraryfriends.com. And finally, of course, I want to say a giant thank you to our guest of honor, Mr. William Kent Kruger. Make sure you follow his exploits, williamkentkruger.com. Is that right, Kent? That's correct. Kent, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. It's been a joy. And I hope I get to talk to you again very soon. You were a delight, Shannon. And thanks to everybody who tuned in to, to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you all. We appreciate you joining us. And we hope that you will consider supporting the organization. And we'll see you again very soon. Stay safe, stay healthy, everyone.